What if we could create a place where students loved to learn? They measured three things. In all three of those measurements, the Metaversity class was superior to the brick and mortar class and the Zoom class. Professors request to teach on a Metaversity course. What is up, Steve? Felix, a lot is up. Well, I'm so excited to be here with you today. We've got Steve Grubbs, the founder, co-founder and CEO of Big Drinks R, the global leader in building metaversities. These yes. are universities for the metaverse. That's exactly right. And you have such a rich history because, you know, you're not just a person that comes from the tech world, you know, because I think there's a lot of people that try to like, you know, force tech down a certain niche, but rather you've been an educator before. You were a junk, a junk professor for MBAs. Yep. You were a legislator where you were the um, in the House of Representatives in Iowa for the state and you were the chairman of the education committee. Yes. So you've seen all the angles from tech, legislation, education. So maybe you can walk us back. How did you end up at, you know, Victrix R and like where did all that journey start that made you want to, I guess, revolutionize education from such a tech angle? Yeah. So, you know. I've always wanted to make the world a better place, which sounds very idealistic, but, uh, you know, that's why I went in, in high school. I was in speech and debate because I wanted to go into politics mm -hmm. and make the world a better place. Oh, and so, and, and I thought politics was the best place to go and make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. and, and we did some very good things while I was in politics, but I learned pretty quickly that that is a very slow and difficult way to, to change things. And, and in fact, everything in politics if you want to make change, then it almost has to be confrontational. The whole system mm -hmm. is set up for confrontation. And and so... Like, for example, what do you mean with confrontational? So, for example, we have two political parties. Yep. And so what, what you'll find in politics is that frequently the two political parties will, will battle each other on an idea, mm -hmm. which which there's a lot of merit to, to that. Uh, but they'll do it even if, uh, even if generally speaking they wouldn't have otherwise if they weren't in these opposite political parties. They would have just agreed and moved on. So, for example, when you look at local governments where they don't have political parties, you, you, you still see division on major issues, but most things move through municipal government pretty, pretty smoothly because mm -hmm. they, they aren't in these political parties anyway. So Education Committee wrote a bill to the very first tech, statewide technology funding bill. And mm -hmm. this did a lot of things for different schools. We, we met them where they were at. Some schools still needed to be hooked up to the internet. Some schools needed computers. Some schools needed more advanced technology. But at the end of the day, we spent a lot of money. And five, 10 years later, mm -hmm. we didn't really move the numbers at all. And, and so I sat back and I thought about that a lot. And, and it struck me, you know, what is it that makes children or anybody want to learn. Yeah. And and if you think about it, I think we are all this way when you love to learn something. Mm -hmm. So like uh I watched the Food Network. Okay. And I watched the show Chopped a uh -huh. lot because I love to cook. And so I can watch that show. I don't have to write anything down. I can mm -hmm. remember everything. I can remember the proportions and I can go and cook it because I love cooking. Now fishing, I don't love fishing, but I got buddies who love to fish and mm -hmm. buddies who love to golf. And they just will eat that up and they remember everything. So what if we could create a place where students loved to learn? Suddenly 2015 rolls around, 2016, and, and we have the consumer age of virtual reality starting. Mm. Pop one on and I said, this might just be it. Was this the first Oculus or was this Oculus? It was the Rift, the, the Rift. Oculus yep. Rift. Yeah, so, you know, expensive. Tethered, you got a line running from your head to uh, a, a big graphics computer. Yep. Every single school I went into for two years said, oh, we already have computers. And I had to say, your computers won't work. You'll have to buy all new computers. Mm -hmm. So that was a bit of a friction point in of course. getting sales. So, but, but ultimately, you know, we, we kept it funded. We kept going. We had some successes every year that kept everybody paid. And here we are finally... Uh, finally getting some wind in our sails. 100%, you know, it, it's interesting. The VR industry is very interesting from the perspective that the vast majority of players all started in that time era, right? Where it's like, I see 14 a lot, 15 a lot, 16 a lot, sometimes 17. But most VR companies start in that phase. There's a little bit of a drop. You don't see that many co VR companies starting after that. And then maybe now again, you start seeing them com uh, coming up. What was that environment like in 2015? That is, was the age of consumer VR. Yeah. 
and, so, and why why didn't it flourish at the time? Yes, yeah, so there was a lot of hope mm -hmm. when it first came out, and 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 for good reason. The challenge was the friction points were, were so high. Yeah, the, the cost was high. You know, to, to for me just to travel, I had to carry a big expensive headset, a, a big headset, a big computer, mm. and then I'd have to go through this terrible work getting it all set up to do a demo. Just a lot of friction, and so it's hard to succeed in a in a mass consumer business when there's that much friction. So if you think about the adoption of of the phone, you know, Apple really removed all the friction. You know, it's the, the the payments were easy. You know, thirty forty bucks a month back then. It, you opened it up, it just worked. It connected. It was easy, and so of course they own the world, the, the world's largest company now. Um, because they figured out how to remove those friction points. And so it took a while. And so there's all this money in the beginning, 15, 60, nobody gave me any, but, but there was money for, for yeah. these things. And so when I say nobody, I mean no institutional investors. Yeah. Angels carried us through. But um, so then enthusiasm waned. And a lot of companies, most of the companies that were around when I was first starting out uh, are out of business. Mm. Those who are still in business are doing pretty well. But, but lasting through 18, 19, 20, that was tough. And then 21 came. And, and, and first of all, the, the, the advent of the, of the cordless headset, the yep. Quest. Quest 2. Yeah, yeah. With Quest 1 as well. That made a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And then Pico came out with theirs and Vibe. Everybody's coming out with them now, and that, that's made a big difference. But when the cost got down to $300, and, and Meta sold 10 million of these yeah. last year. You know, suddenly it opened the world up to this new possibility. Mm -hmm. And then they changed their name to Meta, which which was good and bad because we were already building Metaversities at yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now everybody thinks when I say Metaversity that it's like named after Meta, which it isn't. But um, not that we don't appreciate all the good work <laughs> that they've put in and, and the help they've provided us. 100%. Okay, so, so that, that, that's been a question. So like now... What are the, the some of the friction points that you still see currently that you think are going to go away? Because even now, like sometimes, you know, I, I pitch, I'm very big believer in VR, and I tell people about it, and they say, "Oh, you know, but it's still a clunky headset. Oh, but it's still um, there's no good content on there yet." Where do you see the first applications of VR? Because you know, there's there's gaming, there's non-linear experiences, there's things like education, there's things like people can use VR for uh, learning about a job, right? Which uh, you've, we've done some of that also. Um, what do you think will be the first segment where there will be some saturation where people say, hey, this actually makes sense. This is I prefer this over the analog. Yeah. So uh, maybe because of my debate or politics background, I sort of enjoy trolls on Facebook mm -hmm. or any other medium. And so, you know, I had a lady do a comment on one of our Facebook posts and mm -hmm. she said, uh, I would never use a doctor who had been trained in your virtual reality, that would that's just not good enough, and, and et cetera, et cetera. And, and so I replied back to her and I said, well, would you ever use an airline pilot who trained on a VR simulator? Because they all do. Right. And the point is that in order for this to succeed, mm -hmm. you have to find the right use cases. Mm -hmm. And so simulation training, especially things that are like dangerous. So for example, think about the guy or gal who has to climb up uh, that, that big cell phone tower. They got to climb up those things and they got to fix it. Well, training for that is difficult because you just got to go really do it. Mm -hmm. And it's dangerous when you're training. Of course. But what if you create an inexpensive simulator where they learn to do it, they learn to buckle in, they learn where everything is, so that the time by the time they actually get there to the training, second nature. Mm -hmm. And so same with medicine, all these things that are difficult, for example, you know, uh, electricians, you know, fixing a downed power, power line, mm -hmm. all of these things, highly dangerous, but you can create simulations that dramatically reduce the danger. So use case matters. Our company, Victory XR, we have found a use case that, that just makes, that solves a problem because a lot of the first companies just built VR without mm -hmm. solving a problem. So the problem we solve is that most online education sort of sucks. Oh, 
time soon. Yeah. I mean, you never. When was the last time we heard a student get done with a, a Zoom class and say, "Man, that was awesome." Right. I loved that. It's <laughs> can can I go back and do more? But when they get done taking a class on a metaversity campus, so like uh, Dr. Morris at, mm -hmm. at Morehouse College. When she takes the students to the starship, mm -hmm. and then she passes out molecules and atoms for them to construct for their inorganic chemistry class, mm -hmm. they get done with that class and they say, "Man, that was awesome." Or the go ahead. And it's worth no, it's, it's worth pausing here for a second, and saying, you know, this is not because a lot of times when it comes to tech companies, it's all concept and ideas. No, this you guys actually have, I think, ten units already in the pilot program that's starting soon. And then Morehouse College was the kind of the pre-pilot that's already run a whole class on this, right? Yeah, we're, we're over 20 schools now. Wow. We should be at 40 to 50 by the end of the year. Um, NYU mm -hmm. just came on board. That's incredible. University of Iowa, Go Hawks, just came on board. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so many others. It's it, literally every week we're signing two or three new colleges mm. um, because it solves a problem. It, you know, remote learning is growing, right? Yep. I mean, uh, you guys aren't that far out of college. I'm ways out of college. Mm -hmm. um, but remote learning is growing, and that is a mega trend that's, that's going to continue. Um, and so if that's the case, what are we going to offer students in chemistry and biology and nursing and history? Are we just going to say, here's this 2D screen and, and Zoom and have fun? Yeah. It just doesn't, it doesn't work. And so you've got to allow students to actually use their hands to manipulate objects, to move things, mm -hmm. to, to learn. And it's funny, and you know, one of my other founders, actually in a podcast episode, you know, made this point that he said VR actually makes people be more present. And trolls hated that comment. They're like, "Oh no, there will be ads too, will be distracted." But the reality is, when I'm on Zoom, I've got 20 other tabs open. I've got three screens. I've got my phone next to me, buzzing and stuff, right? But when we were, you know, we had Daniel, JP, myself in Victor XR, like doing the demo, and you're not doing anything else. You're just there. You're actually present. You're experiencing things. And that means you're not getting distracted by those other tabs. And so I think VR, in a way, even if people don't want to hear it, it actually does make people more present in yeah. that reality. Yeah, and, and I don't care if they want to hear it because the reality is greater retention from students and study after study after study show that, that students just learn more if they have a VR headset on. The big question is when we move into AR. Mm. Because uh, this fall, we have all of our partners in place to begin building the world's first AR metaversity. Ooh, okay. And, and that's tricky because the technology is not quite there yet. Yeah. But it's close. Close enough that we can start building. I guess the best building. headset is uh, Magic Leap or what do you have for nope. AR? Uh, we're going to use the Lenovo A3 okay. because it's just glasses. Mm -hmm. And so you know, that's where we want to get to. It's just you're wearing your glasses and and so think about these use cases for AR. So VR is great when you're remote. Yep. But when you're all sitting around the same table and you have headsets on, it feels like you're really sort of cutting yourself off from everybody yep. else in the room, even though you're seeing them inside VR. Mm -hmm. So it, it works well, but AR would work better because I've got my glasses on. I can see everybody around the table, mm -hmm. but sitting in front of all of us is this human body. And we can all see it. And then the professor, she gets up, she plunges her ha hand down into the chest, pulls out a human heart. And we currently do this in VR in our cadaver lab. But with AR glasses, you see everybody, you see the room, but you also see that human body. Then you still have your glasses on. You leave class. You go walk outside on the sidewalk going from one building to another. Mm -hmm. And now you see spinning coins. And you kick that coin and it goes into your wallet. And now you can use that that campus coin at, you know, potentially it's, you know, there for an event that's coming up or potentially it's there for a particular store, or maybe it's just the campus coin that can be used, you know, generally throughout uh, a lot of different places. Yeah. I mean, they could look, I mean, even if it's not outside, if it, like, let's say it's actually in the classroom, that's a great way to make sure that people actually have attendance. You know, what, what are universities struggling with? Kids skipping class, right? So this is a good way to get them to actually, you know, show up. That's interesting. I hadn't thought of that, but you're right. You <laughs> show up and there's a coin there. You just grab your coin. Yeah. And and with AR, you know, you can actually because it's with ge well, with geofencing, you can actually make it location based. Um, and it's something that that I actually loved about you know that that whole concept is that 
you know, building out really nice schools is, is incredibly expensive, right? I mean, bringing, you know, let's say state of the art, like science labs, or even like every single time you operate on a heart, you know, or frog or something, I mean, that, that costs money too, right? And so whether that is even just purely domestic, we don't even have to talk about like, let's say third world countries, like literally just in the US, lower income, uh, you know, a, a school zones, right? Can have these same capabilities that a private school might have, because now it's just they're using the same tech, the same overlays that you guys can use at scale. Yeah, well, one of the statements that sometimes people ask, and it and it drives me nuts because it it's just so wrong, mm. is they they say, well, you know, doesn't doesn't VR just exacerbate you know inequity in education because some students will have the technology and some students won't? And I say, the greater inequity in education, especially mm -hmm. higher ed, is that you have to drive or get on an airplane and fly to Boston to go to school and live there. You yep. can't live at home. You're living in a dorm. That's expensive. Yep. Whereas for $400, yeah. you can have an entire campus in your headset and you can have your professor and all the other students, you know, for the cost of one plane ticket. And I mean, don't get me started on college textbooks. I mean, you know, oh a single gosh. college textbook might run you $400. And so like for the price of a textbook, you can get the tech stack for everything. Exactly. And now something I want to kind of push back on, because this has been brought up to me, was, you know, every couple of years we have these innovations where, people, you know, I remember I was in high school and all of a sudden the school decided, let's get a lot of iPads. Everybody's going to use an iPad, right? And there's there's been other technologies where then the school buys it, but the teachers kind of resist. And I think it was actually Alex, um, you know, from, from Juba that, that gave me a really cool um, story where he said, you know, there's a story that, you know, some, somebody from the medi medieval times takes a time machine, right? And he comes to the present and he's overwhelmed by everything, right? He goes on the streets, cars, loud sounds, airplanes, everything. The one place he finds peace, the one place that, you know, kind of reminds him of home is in the school, right? In the classroom, because they're still <laughs> reading books. It's still like chalkboards. It's still like old school as if nothing has changed. Why is it that educators are so resistant to change? So if you stop and think about why people change, what is the human motivation? There, there's mm -hmm. a couple of reasons, but the primary reason is people adopt change when it improves their life, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, they're, they're going to make the effort to go out and buy a 40 inch TV rather than that 16 inch TV because they can watch their football games or their movies in, in a much better way. So mm -hmm. they, they adopt change. In what way is a public school teacher's life better? after they adopt technology. More headaches, mm -hmm. they don't get paid any more money, their life is not easier. The student might learn more, so that's an intrinsic motivation, but at the end of the day, the teacher's life isn't any better because they've adopted, adapted to change or adopted change. And so that's something you always have to think, humans will be human. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, my father was a school teacher and he was really good at trying new things. But he was also one, he would come home and say, ah, they're trying this damn thing. Yeah. And, you know, they're going to expect all of us to get on board. But we tried that back in 1972. And, uh, you know, so, yeah. so, you know, that, that you're going to always have resistance to change except when change it makes somebody's life better. And so that's a, that's a challenge in schools that, that we have to overcome. But if you look at where we were when I was in school, back in the day, mm -hmm. uh, you know, every student at, at many school districts now has a laptop. Yep. And if they don't, they've got a computer in their hand. And, and because of that, uh, learning has improved dramatically with or without schools adopting that change. And, and so you, you would say, so, you know, cause here's the funny thing, I think when it comes to education, I feel like when it comes to education, because it's kind of the heart of society, it, it really defines the future of any country, of any society. Everybody has an opinion on it. Everybody has a very strong opinion. Generally, it's they. Everybody says, "Oh, they're doing everything wrong." Like the schools are doing everything wrong. Universities are doing everything wrong, um, and and that goes both ways. Either they're doing it wrong because they're too old school, or because now with they would say like with technology, there's more distractions. So you know, since you are an educator and legislator, and from a tech tech perspective, you know, what are the things where you say, "Hey, this part of education so far has been done right. This is where technology has been too much, or this is a place where." VR or other types of tech really make a big difference. Yeah. So I think, first of all, most technology, I'm, I'm a big tech guy. So, you know, it's the first guy on my mm -hmm. dorm floor to have a computer. 
Uh, so I, I generally believe that most technology can improve education. The, the challenge is that if uh, there's so many examples that we can point to mm -hmm. when teachers did not receive the proper professional development training, yeah, yeah, and proper training, and so it just sits in the closet. Yep. And and, and that's a that is a real tragedy because they spend a lot of money on this. Yeah. You know, so for example, we created a PD, a professional development program, mm -hmm. where teachers get a micro certificate. And, and, and I, I wanted to go back to one thing, yep. and that is, if you think about higher education, if you're a professor, you might teach one to two classes a day, right? Sure, yeah. So, and when you do that, you got to get up from wherever you're at. You got to go to that class, mm -hmm. and you got to teach it. And, and so a lot of them sort of liked being able to teach from home. Mm. So if you are a metaversity professor, mm -hmm. you can be on the beach in Miami and teach your <laughs> class. Maybe not quite with a headset on, but but you can. Yeah. You've got more freedom in your life, and 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 you're all meeting in the same class. All the students get to meet in the same mm -hmm. class, and you get to go amazing places. And in one in a one hour class, you can go stand on the Great Wall of China. So that does improve. Yeah. The oh, life. and I, I think there's one feature that teachers will love, which is that you can mute your students. <laughs> I was just about ready to say that. I told my dad this. I said, "Look, Dad, the thing that I'm building." Because I want him to like understand what I'm yeah. doing. You know, he's 80 now. And I want him to, to be proud of what I'm doing. And, and I said, look, Dad, when, when that teacher stands up there and class is just getting started and the teacher is like wants everybody to shut up and sit down, all she or he has to do is press a button. They all are quiet. Press another button. They're all seated. He said, oh, that's not possible. <laughs> I said, well, you got to put yourself in VR because it is possible. And, yeah. ev and teachers do it all the time. And so, yeah, that's a that's a big improvement. Yeah, that, that that's fascinating. Um, maybe we can explain kind of the, the, the medium. Um, you know, why the because in the beginning you said the schools that you went to said, oh, we already have computers, right? Why is VR so much more effective than let's say desktop or mobile, and also over textbooks? And do you think that VR will be used in conjunction with maybe still traditional textbooks and so forth, or is just like purely now going from learning by reading? To more learning by experiencing because that's kind of what it felt like when i was there like we were deep in the ocean learning about fish we were in this space uh, space station learning about molecules with molecules huge life size in front of us yeah so um what i believe will occur is is a hybrid model mm -hmm. so so part of it will be asynchronous mm -hmm. meaning you know you you have an assignment to to watch or to read a, a video or, or a reading material and you do that on your own but I think that you will still have these synchronous opportunities, meaning in class with a live teacher or professor. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work for everybody that, that's an online or remote learner, but, but it still matters because I still think that when, when a concept is difficult, you need humans teaching humans. Mm -hmm. There's just no better way to learn than have a, have a human understand where you're running into trouble, sort of like... Uh, with tech support, you know, you're, you're doing some coding, you're trying to figure out a problem. You know, I've got really smart coders that work for us, but they run into issues and they need to talk with somebody, find somebody who can w mm -hmm. walk them through that problem, a human teaching a human. So, so we think that that really matters, you know, like in medical doctors, the whole deal thing, it, it really matters. So if you, in, in what we do, if you, a, a good example is we just launched the Galapagos Islands. Mm -hmm. This is a combined history science experience. So you start out on the HMS Beagle, mm -hmm. which Darwin was on traveling the world, and then you disembark to the Galapagos Islands. And so, you know, the Galapagos is always this sort of thing that comes up either in evolution or science class or history class, but now you're actually there with the with the giant tortoises mm -hmm. and the and the uh, the the the, the birds with the special beaks, mm -hmm. the finches with the beaks that uh, became so famous in Darwin's paper, and the, the, the blue-footed boobies, all these crazy animals that you don't see anywhere else. And, and it helps the whole concept to come to life if you can stand there amongst them and reach down and, and pet the, the giant tortoise and see how big those giant tortoises really are. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, that's why it's superior. But let's say we're teaching a creative writing class. Well, if we're doing a creative writing class, let's say we're going to write a story about, I think uh, back in the day you wrote one about the state of Florida. What if you could 
jump in and travel to Florida mm-hmm. and experience it. Right. Yeah. Then go back, but but your entire class is not going to be in VR because most of your writing it's going to be uh, you know writing or having instruction on how to you know put sentences together properly yeah. that kind of thing. So it, it'll be a hybrid model, and I think um, you know it, it's a it's a it's a wonderful way that students are learning today. It'll be even more wonderful when all students are learning this way. You know, because something we talked about in the pre-roll too is that I, I made the comment for myself. The most important things of my education a lot of times happened outside the classroom. You know, and I made the comment like, for example, in high school, it was debate, right? That, you know, where I learned so much about like, you know, negotiation, talking and so forth. And then in college, it was actually my fraternity life where I learned more about like, you know, interpersonal skills, um, you know, leadership and so forth. Um, how do you make sure that we don't, you know, I, I think this is, would be common pushback that people say, hey, if we go into VR and so forth, we would lose that interpersonal touch that, for example, like you, you have from being in the classroom or like, and, and part of me thinks that not my answer, I don't want to like steal, the, steal your thunder out. My, my, my push, my, my answer would be we're actually getting closer back to that compared to Zooms because in Zooms, like Zoom call starts. You don't talk to anybody else. Zoom call ends. You can't even like, you know, one of my favorite memories, memories like when I was in college and I cared about the class, I would go to the teacher after school, after, not after school, after the class, right? Go up to the, and then ask extra questions because I was so curious and would learn more. But it's just Zoom call, it's over, done, right? So how do you create that human experience again, even in a digital world with VR? Yeah, so have you ever met an astronaut in person? You're down here in Florida. Mm, Cape no, Canaveral can't be that Well, actually, far yes, I, I've, I've been to SpaceX headquarters, yeah. Yeah. So probably. Okay, so you're at least close to it, right? Yeah. How many students get to meet an astronaut? It's Less hard. than point Yeah, zero. some small, right, some small percentage. What, what we can do and what we do mm-hmm. is we bring in speakers. We have a theater in the round, mm-hmm. and a speaker can come in, and the students can be assembled mm-hmm. in the theater in the round, and that speaker can get up and speak. So let's say, you know, one of my goals is to bring on guest speakers and have them jump around mm-hmm. to different campuses um, and schedule them in. So, you know, we pay for them to do this and then mm-hmm. they go to campus to campus. So uh, let's say we start with an astronaut mm-hmm. and we bring an astronaut in to speak about, you know, whatever it is they're going to tell us. But then they start in the theater in the round and then whoever's hosting the astronaut says, okay, all let's finish this conversation up on the moon. Mm-hmm. And so next thing you know, they transport through the portal to the moon, and now they're on the moon base mm-hmm. with the astronaut on Tranquility Bay, where, of course, the first landing on the moon occurred. Mm-hmm. And, and Tranquility Bay looks exactly like it did when, when, when the Americans first landed on there in 1969. And so mm-hmm. to have the astronaut, to be able to be around this astronaut standing on Tranquility Bay, this is something never before possible. And, and it, and you get to interact with that astronaut. You can mm-hmm. fist bump him. You can walk up to him and ask him a one-on-one question. You can raise your hand, ask a question in a group. You can break into small groups, mm-hmm. work on a, a project, and then come back together and discuss those projects. That all happens in a metaversity classroom. And a classroom does not have to have four walls. It can be the moon. Yeah. It can be the ocean. It can be dinosaur island. It can be an art history museum. No, it's, I, I, I you know, uh, I was gonna say I get it. Being the, I think the reason I get it is because I did the demo, right? And like it's it's so different seeing it and experiencing it than just hearing about it. Because I think when you first hear about it, uh, and I think this is what is with the metaverse to most people. When people hear the metaverse, they think it's very abstract. They think there's a lot of hype. It's all words. But the reality is there are a lot of companies that are already there, like yourself, right? It's not that you are looking to build this. You've built it. It's yeah. not that you're looking to have universities use it. You've got 20 universities, right? You have even had, you know, the first universities that go through entire classes. And I think you have some pretty incredible stats from that. Like, what were some of the, the outcomes when it came to, like, um, when quantifying how effective it was at Morehouse? Yeah, so Morehouse College just started their fourth semester. Mm-hmm. And this is what we've seen. So they launched with three courses. Yep. Three professors, world history, cool. freshman biology, and inorganic chemistry. Great. This semester, they have 10 courses. They have wow. over 20 professors who have requested to teach on a metaversity, in a metaversity course. Mm-hmm. So, you know, A, that was heartening for us to know that professors wanted to do this. Mm-hmm. Pretty cool. But the data, so Professor Hamilton, who's a uh, United States Navy retired, he teaches wor- uh, world history at Morehouse College. 
he taught the exact same course three ways. Brick and mortar classroom, traditional, online, typical 2D online, like a mm -hmm. Zoom type class, and then his Metaversity classroom. And then they measured three things. Student satisfaction, which matters when they're paying $40,000 in tuition. Mm -hmm. um, student performance, mm -hmm. you know, are they actually learning anything? And then student engagement, which is measured by class attendance. In all three of those measurements, the Metaversity class mm -hmm. was superior somewhat significantly to uh, the brick and mortar class and the Zoom class. Students attended class more because it's fun and engaging. Mm -hmm. They learned more, their grades went up. Wow. And uh, at the end of the semester when they fill out their, you know, how happy were you with this class? They were very happy. And so if you are a university administrator and you're trying to explain why students should attend your school or why they should pay all that money for tuition, well, you want your customer, the student, to A, learn something, mm -hmm. learn a lot, and B, be happy. And that's what, uh, that's what we were able to show was delivered at Morehouse College. Do you think there's going to be metaverse native universities, meaning where there literally is no physical school? There's only pure metaverse, pure metaversity. And that's kind of like global. And, you know, because on one hand, so like that, I guess that's I'm going to say the second part. So I'll let you answer that one first. So let's talk about University of Maryland Global and Western Governors University. Okay. So uh, if you look at the great growth in higher education the last 20 years, mm -hmm. um, Western Governors University is a brand new university. They just were founded like 20 years ago. Oh, wow. Okay. They're now the largest university in the United States, 133,000 students. Their president is a former Amazon executive. So think about that. He, he didn't come out of higher education. He's an Amazon executive. Mm -hmm. He understood what it meant, and they have no buildings. At least they don't have, wow. their students are all online. So we know that this is where the growth is. University of Maryland Global, and I bring up Western Governors because our, our first uh, venture capital investor is the uh, venture capital arm of Western Governors University mm -hmm. called Juvo. So, you know, they, they understand remote learning. Mm -hmm. They know it's a, it's a thing. And they know that what we're providing is a quality product. University of Maryland Global has this amazing guy named Daniel Mintz, mm -hmm. who, who is a little bit older than me, but completely sees the future. You know, very few people can actually see the future no matter what age mm -hmm. they are. Dan sees the future. And so year one, proof of concept. Year two, expanding and, and testing and iterating. And year three, mm -hmm. all in. University of Maryland, I think, Global, I think has uh, like 70,000 students and all online. So when we built their Metaversity, we said to them, look, everybody else, we built a, an exact digital twin of their campus. Mm -hmm. You can have whatever you want because you don't have a digital twin for us to build. Mm -hmm. And so they got to come up with some cool buildings and cool, you know, they got to design their campus the way they wanted to design it. So mm -hmm. that's what we did. So, so the answer is yes, completely native Metaversities and American high schools doing the same thing out of... Um, Right out, right out of Miami here. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got 3,000 students globally online, and now they've started uh, offering their VR courses, Metaversity courses. And so those students come in and in a headset, and they meet together in class. How do you view this happening from a, the, the, the instructor-student relationship? You know, university oftentimes, like one of the big, biggest marketing pieces, the student-teacher ratio, like maybe for every one teacher, there's 11 students. Um, it, I, is this something that is aimed to be scalable where you have, let's say, pre-recorded classes or that you have one teacher teach, let's say, a million people at the same time? Or is it really still meant to be the same small curated environment where the teacher is actually there real time and the teacher really only oversees 5, 10, 20 people? Yeah, so I, we, it's hard to know mm -hmm. what, what it will ultimately happen. Mm -hmm. But our guess is that it'll be some of each, some of all. Okay. Because... You know, there's certain things that you really want. If I'm teaching med school, I probably want a, a seasoned surgeon taking right. these medical students through surgery in, in a simulator, in a VR simulator. That, that before they actually, you know, a buddy of mine, I have two buddies that are surgeons. And I can remember saying, you know, well, what was it like? I mean, how do you just cut into somebody for the first time? I mean, do you go practice on something? And they said, you know, there's a little bit of dissection, but for the most part, you're there, they hand you the scalpel, they say, there are the lines, 
in you go. Have at it. <laughs> so I thought, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So, so you know, what we know that we can do is create the world's best simulators yeah. for med students. And, and so that's probably going to be five to seven students. Mm. But at the same time, because, uh, for example, our um, we have a forklift training. And so if you're a student, this takes you from beginning to end for OSHA. So there's like this OSHA test you can take and mm. this forklift training test and and uh, pass it. And so this takes you beginning to end on that. And so a student can just get on the forklift and it teaches them all the way through. So you can have a million students doing that to one professor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, more you need tech support than a, than a professor because uh, like in our animal dissections, when you dissect that cat, mm. I know everybody wants to dissect a cat. Um, I'm saying that because I know there's a lot of cat lovers listening I probably. That's um, so that's why it's a virtual. You, at the end, you push a button and the cat comes back together and it meows, very happy. But we have Wendy, the hologram teacher. Mm -hmm. She's there teaching all the way through it, step by step, explaining exactly what they should do, exactly what they're seeing, and exactly what they should learn. And it's just digital. Yeah. It's a, it's a software as a service model. It's incredible. I mean, I, I think I'm really looking forward to like when those first students graduate, you know, take their virtual skills, so to say, you know, to the the real world, so to say, you know, because I think, in, well, first of all, to me, I, I don't even like the terms real world anymore because um, I'm so deep down this road now that I really believe that the physical world based reality is a way to experience. Like, that's like our experience layer, so to say, like, you know, we can do all our learning like in the metaverse, right? We can uh, a lot of work already happens digitally. I mean, already now most people work digitally, right? Um, this is like, and, and actually like from a pure environmental perspective, like we can actually take care of this planet. We can like, you know, treat this real well. And like, we can experience things here because all the stuff like learning, work and so forth can literally happen digitally. Um, but that's a completely different uh, path. Well, and, and on that point, I always refer to it as the atom based world versus the bit based world, mm -hmm. because yeah. that's really what we're talking about. Makes a lot of sense. Um, one, to go back to one of the points I was trying to make uh, earlier, and then we kind of like went back was... Um, one of the biggest parts of education too is like the interpersonal relationships, right? So for example, whether it's, we're talking elementary school, high school, college, and so forth, particularly I think in the early for formative years, right? It's equally important that the, the, the kids, so to say kids, I mean, I'm not that old, but still that they um, make friends, that they learn social skills and so forth, that they're not lonely and isolated and so forth. How does a metaversity lend itself to building those relationships and then um, are metaversities clustered locally or are they just completely remote and global? Yeah, let me give you three specific examples. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Morris, head of uh, Morehouse Metaversity, she has Meditation Mondays mm -hmm. where voluntarily students can meet her yep. and uh, they, they talk and then they meditate together. Mm -hmm. And so that's a really interpersonal moment Mm. That they don't all have to get in their cars and drive to a yoga studio and meditate together. Mm -hmm. So, so that's example number one. Example number two, what, in, in our metaversity programs, students check out a headset for the entire semester. Mm -hmm. They take it home, they game with it, they learn with it. And we have this wonderful student lounge or student uh, recreation facility where they can come together and study together. Mm. So, you know, they meet and they study, you know, whatever it is for their test or whatever they might want to do. So that gives them an opportunity to be together in the same place to have presence. Mm. And, and that's the, the big shift here is that unlike Zoom, uh, this gives you the opportunity to have presence mm. so that, that if you and I fist bump, we're going to feel it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're just at the very beginning of haptics. Yes. But every year it will progress one step further and, and that what, changes everything. Which sense do you think is next with haptics? Well, definitely not smell. Thank goodness. <laughs> um, you know, first of all, I think the next big technology change with that is facial expressions, mm. which, yes. which will allow us, you know, one of the challenges is if I tell a joke, I can't see if you're smiling. Right. I can hear it's you just laugh. A straight yeah. like right a few so, polygons yeah which is always a little odd i want to finish that oh, last yeah, thing other well because um we also will have social directors on campus so you know we have all these campuses and and so on friday nights probably maybe it'll be thursday nights we intend to have social events you know a dj 
We'll have, um, you know, a party. And so the students can come together. They can meet each other and, and listen to a DJ and talk. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're not really sure how all that's going to progress, but we're going to try it and, and see sort of how best to organize social life uh, on a Metaversity campus. Now, yeah. will this prevent them from going to the bars on Friday or Saturday night? I doubt it. That That's not the idea is to prevent them from going out. But but for those who like to stay in or want to meet students from other campuses, it's an easy way for them to uh, to do that. And, and then finally, um, we also believe that uh, we can have competitive athletic events on Saturdays. Mm -hmm. Anybody who thinks, you know, there's this like... Uh, it's really ignorant view of virtual reality. Mm -hmm. that people are sitting in chairs and that they're s sedate. Yeah. Anybody who's ever, uh, you know, there's this this great boxing game in VR, mm -hmm. and you know, I could do that for like three minutes and I was exhausted. All right. Yeah. You actually like walking a lot, jumping a lot, sweating. I mean, yeah. it's it's an active session to be in VR. Exactly. And so what we know is we can create some competitive uh, events inside the Metaversity campuses mm -hmm. where. You know, we've got Morehouse College competing against the University of Kansas this week and West Virginia competing against South Dakota State and New Mexico State. And, and it's not so much esports. It's like esports, mm -hmm. but they're actually physically doing things. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll see where that progresses. But this is our vision, socials and competitive athletics and uh, learning and studying. How many hours do you think people will end up spending in, in the metaversities at that point? Because then you're you to class, you got the social, you're, you're probably spending most of your day, is it? I, I don't think so. You know? I think, you know, with a class, maybe you take uh, two to three classes a day okay. in in a metaversity lab. So most of those classes are about 45 minutes long. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's, you know, two hours and 15 two minutes. Hours, yeah. So not, not too much. And then let's say you get together in the evening to study for an hour, mm -hmm. three hours and 15 minutes. And then, you know, to make all the critics happy, then you're out walking and running in the park the rest of the time. There you go. Right. So, yeah. And you can also cross media, you know, I mean, if you, if you make friends in the metaversity, nothing stops you from crossing the chasm and like, you know, for example, meeting IRL or meeting on Zoom or having a phone call or texting and so forth. One thing I also found interesting was that, you know, as I, as I thought more about the concept of metaversities uh, and even, I don't know if you're looking at all going earlier stage, like for example, schools, high schools, I don't know, but you know, one of the big topics, like especially when you're in high school is, you know, bullying, there's pressure, there's, you know, there's, there's so many distractions that lead away from the actual education where it's like, what are you wearing? What do you look like? And so forth. And that all falls away when you're in a virtual environment because you can literally change your avatar. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's a really interesting topic. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there's a debate about this because if you look at Fortnite, right, mm -hmm. with Fortnite, they, they sell a billion dollars mm -hmm. of digital clothing, essentially, yep. or accoutrement, you know, things to skins, make yourself yeah. look better, skins. Um, and that sort of gets back to the same old problem of people comparing themselves on, on how they look. So, sure. you know, it's our hope that that it will not be our business model, mm. that, that our business model will allow somebody to go in, choose their avatar, they can make it look like whatever they want, and then um, and choose their hairstyle and their clothing, and, and everybody has an equal opportunity to express themselves on how they look or how they how they want to look. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think in most ways that's very positive. Yeah. You know, some people, people, critics can always find something to right. uh, to, to. Then they say that the bullying and pressure is important, so they toughen up and they become the right. people that they need to become. Sure, right. and, and there's something to that. You know, yeah. we all get socialized, and mm. but but at the same time. Um, I, I do think that uh, giving – you could be from the poorest neighborhood in the south side of Chicago and uh, you could be in there with somebody from, uh, you know, Amherst and you wouldn't know it. Yeah. That's powerful. And, you know, it, again, the, the literally the barrier of entry is a $300 headset, which may become available at public libraries and other places and schools. Um, and an internet connection. And, you know, funny enough, you know, well, now Facebook Meta is the same thing, right? Meta owns Oculus. Well, Oculus now literally called the Meta Quest, not, not, not only the Oculus Quest. And, you know, years ago, I remember reading articles about how Facebook and, well, now Meta is bringing Wi-Fi and, like, internet connection, for example, to a lot of third world countries. Like, they're flying drones over Africa to bring internet connectivity, right? And because, obviously, the, there's many, many countries that, you know, we have tech giants in the West and we have tech giants in the East, you know, from, let's say, ByteDance, 
versus you know uh, Meta, and or, or SpaceX. Oh, SpaceX, right now with Starlink, right? But it, it it wouldn't even be crazy to think that companies like Meta would provide a lot of headsets, you know, for free, so to say, to you know lower income places, so that they have access. Yeah. And then you're really even the playing field where anybody can get access to this kind of like skill building information and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you will see that, you know, first of all, you have the Gates Foundation mm -hmm. that, that looks for projects like these to, to fund. Um, they haven't funded us yet, but uh, one of these days they will because it we, makes so much we're sense. We're about to get talked about conspiracy theorists, by the way. We just said big tech, Meta is working on things. Bill Gates is working on things. Careful now. Yeah. I know. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I come from politics. All right. Yeah, yeah. So, you, you know, the, the reality is what I love about what we're doing mm -hmm. is that I, I really don't think that it can be co opted by, you know, a Fortune 10 company mm -hmm. because it, it's there's going to be so much power mm -hmm. coming from individuals that, uh, you know, you, you look at I mean, big corporations will always find ways to have influence. Mm -hmm. But this metaverse, as it's going to come, as it is coming together, uh, will be the most um, libertarian place on earth. Take more into that. Well, yeah. You know, so because people will be say like, keep big tech out of my kids like education, right? Yeah. How's the libertarian? Well, so here's here's what's going to happen. Um, two two big things are going to happen. A lot of people can't get their heads around this, but you'll have international standards developing, mm -hmm. which allows free travel between all metaverse worlds. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, words it's like um, it's like having a free jet ride from any country on Earth to another country on right. Earth. So, the cost of entry to build a metaverse world is already coming down. And it will be even lower. So, you know, people will build their own metaverse worlds. You know, you'll have, you know, the, the political metaverse worlds and you'll have the sporting metaverse worlds and whatever. You'll have all these metaverse worlds built by average folks, just sort of like websites. Yeah. Right. I agree. And you'll be able to just like you can move from website to website, you'll be yeah. able to move from world to world. So that disempowers anybody from creating one that controls everything. So that's number one. Number two is what I believe ultimately happens is that currency mm -hmm. um, moves to a, a, a very liquid coin-based currency. Mm -hmm. And and again, a currency that's not controlled by any central government. Right. And so once you get to that point where individuals are able to build their own worlds and coins have extremely low friction and, and are extremely liquid, mm -hmm. suddenly power uh, that that is the whole paradigm that we exist in is this this paradigm of of strong countries and strong corporations mm -hmm. what i think happens in the future is that we have this paradigm where individuals create their own tribes mm -hmm. and and people can choose, you know, maybe I build a tribe and somebody from China can join my tribe. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we probably will continue to have some uh, firewall issues there. So mm -hmm. we'll have to think about that. But ultimately, over time, you'll have this really very fluid world that uh, is pretty much impossible for any one government to control mm -hmm. or corporation. Yeah, no, I, I see a lot of that already also in like in the Web3 space where it's such a community-driven area where we see ourselves, you use the word tribes, which I agree with. And I think four years ago, I made videos about how I actually can see ourselves going from, you know, globalization, like every, everybody's equal to now we're slowly having these subcultures in many different places where we have shared values, even though we are not local, like the last few thousand years were defined by locality, right? We were all in the same geographic area, right? These are people from my town. This is the only people I know and associate with. That's gone, right? Now I can actually choose people that share values where one person might be in China, one person might be in Germany, one might be in Dubai, it doesn't matter, right? We can be from all of the place where we're not tied by geographics, but rather we're tied by values, beliefs, and so forth. We can have our own digital assets, right? Whether that's, you know, NFTs and like visual things or currencies, as you said. And so, Every community, right? Every tribe can have their own system, so to say, right? Yeah. If you stop and think about the transition from, say, 1900 mm -hmm. to 1930 to 1950, so you, you really had no way to digitally communicate 
analog digital mm -hmm. across a, a, an entire country. Then, then we had the advent of radio, mm -hmm. and suddenly you had communication that could span a country immediately, and people gathered around there, and you know, they all sat around their uh, radio and they listened to it, and mm -hmm. and then very quickly television took over, and so everybody you know got rid of their they moved their radio aside. And now they're all sitting around their TV box. Those that big transition changed the world in in so many ways, ways that nobody could have thought of in 1900. Now we are moving to a geographically agnostic existence, mm -hmm. and 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 that that concept of geographic agnosticism changes so many underlining uh, underlining par underlying paradigms that you suddenly have. New business models, new social models, uh, new ways for people to participate in their faith, mm -hmm. um, new ways for people to socialize, new ways for people to learn. It all gets rewritten over time. Institutions die slowly, but we know that this whole this era of geographic agnosticism will change almost every institution in the world. Yeah, it just made me think back to like my, my history classes back in the day. And I remember learning about like how, you know, in 776, you know, when, you know, America, uh, Independence War and so forth, it would take, I think it was like 40 days or so to, you know, sail the ocean and like sh share a piece of information from, you know, from Europe to America. And in, in the span of over a month, you know, like battles were won or lost, right? So if you, like, I think there was even a battle either, I don't remember, I, might, I don't want to misquote you, but there was one battle where either they want to prevent it or they want to attack, but by the time the message got there, the whole thing was already over, like it was already resolved, right? Yeah. And that is not that long ago when you think in the landscape of like human existence, right? Like human existence, many, many, I think millions of years, at least as a species, um, you know, intelligent life, like, I mean, you know, let's say, you know, the modern, like, you know, post, uh, you know, let's say since Roman Empire, Greek Empire, you know, thousands of years. America, that's, it's, we're only talking 250 years here. Right. So radio, it's a hundred years, yeah, 100 you know, years. And, and there was a really interesting, like, even like a video I saw where, you know, the, there's only, I think, 60 some years between the first flight with the Wright brothers and America going to the moon. Right. And so, you know, anybody thinks like, oh, like, you know, whether it's crypto, whether it's metaverse, it will take forever. It's not going to happen in, in, in this time span. Well, look at what else has happened, right. right? And so to now bring it back to something that we started talking about, which kind of fits well in with this, is like, where do you see, what where do you see the next alterations to this experience be? We just started talking about haptics and like facial expressions, and then we got derailed. What does it look like for you? Let's say the next five, 10 years and because right now people mostly know the Unity style virtual worlds, like the ugly picture that Zuck uploaded about, you know, with Meta with the, the Eiffel Town in the background, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I generally think people overreacted to that, but uh, lesson learned by Meta, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, here, here's what we will see the most. Um, you're going to see the form factors of the hardware get smaller, mm -hmm. and you're going to see the advent of glasses. Mm -hmm. So every, you know, we are at the forefront of working on these, this AR metaversity with Lenovo, mm -hmm. T-Mobile, Qualcomm, Victory XR, and St. Ambrose University. And so those glasses matter. They need to come down in cost. They need to come down in size. The batteries need to last longer. You need to have uh, 5G that's mm -hmm. wirelessly first. It'll, it'll hit the phone. So right now that that those glasses have a Connect wire to. that runs from yeah to your phone, mm -hmm. and so then the phone goes to the tower. But what's what what will happen over the next three years, and we will be at the forefront of this, is that the glasses will get a five G chip in them, mm -hmm. and the computing instead of being done on the phone, I mean, it'll first be done on the phone, and so you'll have this Bluetooth, and you'll get rid of the wire. That's stage one, probably by. 2024, the wire's gone, or 2023, and then you'll connect to the phone. But then the phone goes, and the glasses mm. connect directly to the edge computing. So edge computing is this concept that you push off the processing, which requires mm -hmm. storage and, and chips and all of this. You push that off to the edge, mm -hmm. to these edge servers. And, and the speed of 5G, what really makes it a big deal is how quickly the data can get from that tower to your glasses, which is less than 30 milliseconds. Mm. So it's about the speed of a hummingbird flapping their wings. That's how mm. fast it gets there. So 
and that matters in an immersive world if you lift your hand in California. And I've got my glass, and we're in the same space. Yep. You're in California, you lift your hand. I'm in New York. I have to see you lift that hand. That data has to go from your headset to the edge, cross the network, down to my glasses within 30 milliseconds. Right. Because too much latency would then like, you know, interrupt the conversation flow, for example, again. And make you sick even. Right. Latency causes people to get nauseous. Uh, so that has to happen immediately. So that we're going to see happen. So then the glasses have that 5G chip, might be 6G by then, and it goes directly to the edge. And they're lighter because of all this compute being moved. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly the world around you comes to life in an augmented way. So, you know, whether it's wayfinding, whether it's um, banking, whether it's, um, you know, having having things that are there in front of you or maybe just talking to your mom, mm. all of that happens inside your glasses. Yeah, and that's, that's a big moment too when we start moving away from always looking down on phone screens where it becomes way more immersed with our actual real world, right? Because, you know, at that point, you know, right now it's always... You know, people love to hate on the metaverse, but I always tell people, like, look, already today, you're spending most of your day in the digital world. Every day, you're looking down on your phone, right? Like when you're sitting on a subway station, you look down on your phone. When you're in class, you're looking down on your phone. When you're in meetings, you're looking down on your phone. Now, you can take that away and, like, mold, I guess, mix it in with AR, for example, where, you know, um, you can literally see, for example, let's say I meet somebody, and I can, instead of looking them up on my phone on my life to Instagram, I can get some information about them, right, overlaid. Or I'm going my, I go, I go shopping for groceries, right? And I'm like, hey, I want to eat keto today. And then like maybe a virtual, like an AR map shows me around the store, like where, where I can find those things, you know, what's right for me and so forth. Yeah, I can even be a worse procrastinator than I am now. Mm -hmm. Instead of pulling up my phone on the elevator, who is this Felix Hartman guy? <laughs> I can just like go right in the meeting, tap. <laughs> oh, I see who this guy is. And it's funny because, you know, those things sound so far out, but really... My guesstimate is probably like five years. You said three years for AR classes. Well, yeah, I mean they're they're out now. Okay, just expensive, and so um, and that's we're, we're building this AR metaversity this fall. Mm -hmm. We expect that uh, we will have actual use cases deployed in classes for proof of concept next spring, mm -hmm. and then have something for sale by the fall of uh, 2023. And that's all with glasses, not headsets. Amazing. If somebody wanted to sign up uh, or try out virtual universe metaversities today, um, where can they try it out? Yeah, so a couple of things. One, obviously, our website has a ton of information, victoryxr.com, mm -hmm. easy. But our YouTube page, if you just want to understand it, I mean, it's, it's in, in the ideal world, you take a tour. Mm -hmm. Now, you can take a tour just through a PC or your phone, but... Um, I always say that's sort of like uh, your your aunt Bertha mm -hmm. sends you a, a, a postcard of the Grand Canyon. Yeah. That's one thing. But actually standing on the south rim of the Grand Canyon, which I've done a couple of times, it's a far different thing than a postcard. Viewing our Metaversity classrooms through a 2D laptop or through yeah. a phone, that's one thing. It's fine. It works. Um, but actually having the headset on, being in it. So signing up for tour, awesome. VictoryXR.com has places to sign up for tour, but also on our YouTube page, we have over 200 videos. You can just take a look at almost everything and see what's, what's going down and, and, um, and understand it from that perspective. And I think as you would say, mm -hmm. you would agree that there's nothing quite like actually being on the campus and taking the tour, especially if you're lucky enough to get Danny. A hundred percent. Plus I, you know, I, I'm generally a believer in like lifelong learning where Yes, universe is part of our life. And I mean, that's where you guys are starting. But, you know, hopefully, I mean, long term, I could see this being applied for everything from early stages in school. But also, like, online education has been growing so much where people just, they sign up for a course. They want to learn a skill, right? And so I, I think down the road, it would be incredible if, you know, anybody that says, like, hey, I want to freshen up on my history or I want to learn a new skill, they can do that there. And, you know, in a, in a way that's just unimaginable to be done in, in physical reality. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, uh, one of the biggest challenges we have in the United States and probably around the world is the lack of students going into the trades. We need carpenters, we need plumbers, yeah. they get paid well, heavy equipment operators, and we can train all of those kids, you know, post high school, during high school, so that when they get done, they're ready to go to work. Amazing. 
Well, Steve, it's been a pleasure having you on. I think we learned a lot. Um, and I'm going to make sure that we link all the, uh, you know, how people can try it out, get a demo and so forth in the show notes. Really look forward to like, you know, seeing what you're going to be building in the next few years. And um, the lives are going to be impacted because, you know, this is, you know, there's a lot of things in metaverse and VR that seem, you know, I don't want to say superfluous, but they're like, they're just, they're nice to have. But like this can actually, you know, directly be touching people's lives in the most genuine way where if they spend four years going to college and they will forever remember the times they spent in those metaversities, right? They will for the, those skills that they learn in those classes, they, and maybe because of the metaversities, they paid attention versus, you know, drifting off in, uh, in, in classroom will actually impact the course of their life. And so I think what you're building is incredible. Um, and I think the time is right for it. So thank you. I appreciate luck. you having me on and wow, it's always awesome to be in Miami. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you.